Hi, I'm Carl Baldessar, and today we're going to talk about The Who's 1965 hit called My Generation, A Song of Rebellion. Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, Keith Moon, John Entwistle will give us this really high octane performance from 1965, and it is an absolute classic. Today we're going to take a look at this two chord anthemic song, and I'm going to break it down by looking at the guitar tuning, the structure, the chords, the key modulation, the tempo, the lyrics, and the performance, and all of that taken together gave us this great moment in history for rock and roll. So right off the top, I got to tell you that Pete Townsend detuned his guitar, which the name for that in classical music is Scoratura. And I'm a Baldessare, so I can say Scoratura. And that literally means kind of discord or mistuning or not standard. But he detunes the guitar a whole step. And that gives the guitar a much guttier sound. It's just really irreverent sounding when you have it pitched that low and you start slapping on the strings. So you have to have that sound to really get started with this song. The other benefit of having that detuning, it makes the fingerings that much easier and you get these beautiful seventh chord, dominant seventh chords. So he has a, I'm gonna describe them in standard tuning, but they're really a whole step lower. So anytime I'm saying a chord, it's gonna be a whole step lower. But in this case, you've got the, the opening A chord and goes to a dominant seventh in third inversion. So I've got the G on the bottom and that's all there is to the song. But it's great. You can see the finger and how comfortable it really feels great in the hand. So you can tell the song was written by a guitar player for a guitar player. So the first question I look at when I see this song and it only has two chords is how do they actually keep it from becoming boring and let alone make it one of the most anthemic rock songs of all time? And everything I'm going to talk about is how they do that as a composer, the way I look at it. The first thing I'm going to look at is the harmonic rhythm, which is how many chord changes are in a bar. Let me play you the first verse without singing the lyrics, and you can see the structure here is that there's one chord in the first bar, there's no chords in the second bar, there's one chord in the third, and one chord in the fourth. And the difference is in bar three and bar four, they're actually striking quarter notes rapidly at 118 BPM. So this is the, this is the way the music goes here. It goes put this down and they do that again you see that stopping and starting that harmonic rhythm really creates it makes it rather vibrant and you get this kind of you know uh, shock effect of it you get these jolts of electricity just constantly going back and forth so they use this uh, this American blues technique of call and response to, on top of that to make it really textured so you have Roger Daltrey making the call and then you have the background vocals making the response which is talking about my generation so Daltrey's making the statement and then the response is that so when you have people try to put us down and over the intense striking at the 118 BPM quarter notes you get talking about my generation so you got people try to put us down because we get around you see and that really gives you a lot of variety of texture and you can get away for quite a while with that kind of engagement call and response with just two chords and that's what they're doing for the whole song so when you get to the chorus and you look at the harmonic rhythm they actually take it to the next level they put their their foot on the gas and you get one chord per bar struck with 188 beats per minute and so he's going like I hope I die before I get old and then they're repeating talking about my generation this is my generation and the chord structure sounds like this I hope I die before I get old Why don't you all fade away? So that chorus is pretty cool because it actually kind of caps off a verse. It's super accelerated. And when you take the verse and chorus together, it really feels like it's one whole unit. It doesn't feel like every two bars I'm just playing two chords. It really works well to accelerate the energy and complete the unit of a verse and a chorus. But that's not all that they're doing here. So there's actually a bass guitar solo over a verse and chorus a rotation. And John Entwistle lays down one of the most iconic bass guitar solos of all time. In fact, I'm told that it's the very first bass solo on a rock song. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's pretty killer what he did on that. Now let's look at a couple of more elements that they're doing to ratchet up the tension and the energy of the song and to keep it moving forward. Number one, they're actually using a lot of dominant seventh chords and the dominant seventh chords are not getting 
resolved back to a one chord. And that's really where a lot of this tension is coming from. So let's talk a little bit about a dominant seventh chord and its tendencies. So the most important thing you need to know about a dominant seventh chord is that it's dominant for a reason. Is that because it seeks resolution. It is the most unstable chord in diatonic Western music. And in this case, we're using an A7, an A dominant seven. I'm gonna play it this way just so you can hear the change here. So this, this A dominant seventh chord is yearning to go to its natural home chord, which is one in the key of D. So we have, ah, it wants to go home. Dominant sevenths want to go home. And so the resolution and that tendency is caused by this thing called a tritone, which I won't get into, but you can hear it. I'm going to play you in a dominant seventh chord. I have these two tones which is called a tritone. And these two tones want to push in opposite directions to find this resolution. You see? In this song, we have this tension, and that's it. It stays there. It never goes away. Because what they're doing is that instead of going to a D chord from their dominant seventh, they're going to an A chord. They're going from A7 to A, and it's never happy at that point. And that's part of the way that they're keeping the tension here. And moreover, they're actually, for their dominant, their A dominant seventh chord, they've got a third inversion A dominant seventh chord. It's a beautiful thing to play on the guitar because you simply play the A like that, and you put your finger on the G below, so that's the seventh of the chord. So you get this really amazing, gutty dominant seventh chord which so desperately wants to do this. <laughs> it ain't happening in this song, man. It's going. I mean, it's just not a happy situation. And that's how they keep sustaining and building this tension, right? For you visual learners, I'm a very much a visual learner. Let me demonstrate this visually for you with a balloon that I've made that shows the tendency of a dominant seventh chord to want to resolve to the one chord, the home chord. Dominant seventh chord, very unstable, wants to go home to the one chord. Dominant seventh chord, very unstable, wants to go home to the one chord. So the last technique they use here to really blow the song up and kind of just ratchet it into a super tense moment is that they're using key changes, or we call them modulations. And they're actually doing three key changes. So there's four keys in this song. And what they're doing with the key changes is each time they're taking the same two chords and moving them up. And in this case, the key changes are starting in A, and then we go to B, and then we go to C, and then we finally go to D. And each time, and every time you kind of raise up pitch in a song, it's gonna create tension. Let me kind of show you. Let's go from the A section to the B section here. So you've got. You see that? That's just one modulation, one chord change. I'm going from the A to the B. And Yes, and the B, I'm doing B sevenths as well. So on the guitar, it's really cool because you can hit the B like this with a bar chord. And I can let my first finger off and let the open A ring. And again, that'll be a third inversion B dominant seventh. So it's really friendly on the guitar. Like that. And I could also really finger it. This is the other cool way about having this thing detuned is that I could also do it and play it the same shape I was doing the A dominant seventh chord. I was going A, A to a dom seven. I could go B, B to B dom, B dom seven with the A in the, in the root here. So it's really, really comfortable. And now watch. So they're doing that uh, modulation and they're going to go yet another key change. So from the B, they go up to C and they're going to do the same sort of figure. Right? And then finally they wind up here in D. And 
what's really cool about those key changes that they've chosen, you know, they've got a whole step modulation from A to B, half step modulation from B to C, a whole step modulation from C to D, right? And by the way, once they finally get to D, literally things blow up. I mean, they're breaking their instruments, you know, Moon is blowing up his drums and Townsend's cracking his guitar, you know, and it's just perfect how this thing escalates into a total rebellion, right? Musically, sonically. Um, what's really cool though, when you look at the, the, the choice of those chord changes that they're doing is that the, uh, the bass notes of each of those chords and keys that they're using is A, B, C, and D. And if I were to look at that as, say, a scale, an A, B, C, D, those are the first four notes of a blues scale. And it's cool that in their modulation scheme, the arc of the whole song, that they're literally spelling out a blues, the beginning of a blues scale, which takes us back to the beginning. This thing is kind of built harmonically off of blues architecture, and they kind of spell it out. Whether they knew it or not, you know, it doesn't matter. But it's really clever how the key changes are actually sort of spelling out a blues uh, figure. And that's nothing new, actually, as a classical you know, composer. I love looking at how, how uh, composers do this. And the greatest example of that is in Brahms' Fourth Symphony. And I don't know if you follow classical music, have looked at it or love it or whatever, but I recommend you listen to Brahms' Fourth Symphony. It's one of the greatest symphonies in the history of symphonies. And it's so cool. It's symphony and it's in E minor. And what he did was the first movement, the key of the first movement is E minor. The key of the second movement is G major. The key of the third movement is B major. And then finally the fourth movement is in E minor. And if I just take the notes of each movement, E, G, B, E, it spells out an E minor chord. So it was actually sort of a subconscious arc and it sonically feels very coherent because he did that. And in this song, it actually sonically really works that they're staying in this blues scheme with the key changes. I, I know I get excited about this stuff, but it's really, really cool. And it's brilliant because you only had two chords and all these techniques that they used really made this song move forward and never get boring. In fact, it's just the opposite. There's one other element in the song, and I, I can't overlook it. It's uh, Roger Daltrey's uh, use of kind of stuttering in the lyric. And you could just feel the urgency of the song sort of in that sort of uh, stutter that he uses while singing the lyrics. And there's a lot of backstories as to why he you know, did that or what have you. You know, he was probably influenced by John Lee Hooker's Stuttering Blues, which is a really cool blues song you should listen to. But I think in terms of the urgency, it makes sense because this song was re uh, recorded on October 13th, 1965. And guess when it was released? A week later on October 20th, 1965. One week they went from recording the song and then putting it out to the public and it became the 11th greatest song of all time according to Rolling Stone magazine. So there's a bit of urgency in this song and you can feel it. That's kind of the final capstone of all the tension. And I would be remiss if I didn't also do a little bit of historical context for you here. So what was going on in 1965 and in Britain and in the world that sort of is encapsulated in this song? I mean, I'm calling it a song of rebellion. Well, let's take a look at some of the, the, the important sort of things that are happening, right? At that time, and you know, it's still true of all times, but there was, it was about a clash between cultures. You know, we had the establishment versus the youth. We had young versus old. We had mods versus rockers. We had the Beatles versus the Stones, kind of an artificial competition. But, you know, the Beatles released the, the album Help in July 29 of 65, and the Rolling Stones released Satisfaction, which, by the way, has a blues walk-up, a one, two, three blues walk-up. And um, the last two pieces, one for me, one for you, uh, on September 30th in, in Britain, they uh, uh, had the first episode of this amazing escapism series. It was Super Marionation, it was called, and it was titled The Thunderbirds. And they had a few years of these things. And I can't tell you any more about it. This is an Easter egg. Go look it up. It was a lot of fun. It was totally escapism, but it was really pretty cool what they did with the Thunderbirds. So go look it up. My British friends will know exactly what I'm talking about. And then last but not least, I think this pretty much says everything about this song in the Times. On November 13th, 1965, it's the first time that the F word was spoken out loud on British TV. I mean, what could be more emblematic uh, for a song of rebellion and a time of rebellion? And this song was absolutely reflecting all of that. Thank you for watching. I'm Carl Baldessar. 
please like, subscribe, share, and leave me a comment in terms of what you thought about this breakdown. And give me some ideas for some other classic songs that you want me to break down. I'd love to do it for you. Thank you. I'm a Baldassare. All right, so I can say scoratora. It's so good. Mwah! That's a spicy meatball. See that? See how that works? What do we do, Billy? Unstable. Oh, right, okay, one, so he gets one bounce. Dominant seventh, unstable, wants to go home. <laughs> right, here we are, oh jeez! Mr. Wizard, oh, here we go. All right. <laughs> <That was it. laughs>